So our goal is, as we stated yesterday, to find and classify local x dreamer. And as our method for doing this, we identify something we call the first derivative test. And the first derivative test is based on the following facts. It's based on the fact that um, local extrema can only occur at critical values. And it's based on the fact that the derivative changes sign at critical values. So say we have some critical value and at C, the derivative F prime goes from positive to negative. Then C is a local max. And you can avoid some memorization if you just try to think this through. Remember that when the derivative is positive, the function is increasing. When the derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. So if the function stops increasing and starts decreasing, then just looking at the graph, what we have is indeed a maximum, at least a local maximum. Similarly, looking once again at the derivative, if it goes from being negative to being positive, That is a local min. And again, this can be understood in terms of increasing and decreasing functions. If the derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. If the derivative is positive, the function is increasing. So you see where the derivative goes from being negative to being positive is a local minimum. And then if the derivative does not change sign, we have no extremum. And I think we just had time yesterday to give an example of this as well. The classic example is x cubed this has a critical value where the derivative is zero. But this critical value clearly isn't a maximum or a minimum. <laughs> and that's represented by the fact that the derivative is positive to the left of the critical value. You see the function is increasing. It's going up. And 
The derivative is increasing to the right of the critical value. It's still increasing, still going up, as critical value was, represents kind of a speed bump. You see that at the critical value or near the critical value, the function is increasing slowly compared to here, let's say. But it does keep increasing, and there's no maximum and no minimum here. And I just about had time yesterday to mention the phrase sign chart. before class ended. A sign chart, well, let me first give kind of the basis of a sign chart. Critical values are the only values where a function let me rephrase that where a derivative can change its sign. And let's see how we can use that to classify extrema. Let's say we have, let's do this via example. What's a function that has an extrema? Quadratics have an extrema. Let's say p of x equals x squared minus 2x plus 1. And putting aside the fact that this is really a college algebra problem, Always start relatively simple if you can. Let's find and classify the vertex. And the vertex is an absolute extremum. But we don't have a closed interval we're looking at. Well, fortunately, the vertex is also a local extremum. And we kind of touched on this yesterday. A lot of times when you're finding local extremum, Really, you're interested in an absolute extremum, but because you don't have a closed interval, you're using the local extremum technique. We'll do concrete examples of that once we get to word problems. For now, let's tackle this problem. We want to find a local extremum. Well, we know that <clears throat> local extremum can only occur at critical values. I don't know if we've written that down today. We certainly wrote it into our notes yesterday. So step one needs to be find the critical values. 
and finding the critical values are where this turns into a calculus problem because critical values occur where the derivative is zero or where the derivative does not exist. We'll, uh, we'll have to give some examples where the derivative doesn't exist. I think we gave one example, but that would have been sometime next week. Uh, in this example, the derivative exists everywhere. I mean, 2x minus 2, this is, this is just a straight line. When would it not exist? There is no division by 0. There is no square roots. There is no logarithms. There is nothing that would cause this derivative not to exist. So, the only way a critical value can occur is if that linear expression is equal to zero. And, I mean, we all have our algebra prerequisite, but maybe, maybe it was a long time ago. There's no harm in showing the steps anyway. Add two to both sides. Divide 2 into both sides. x equals 1. So, we don't inherently know that 1 is at the vertex. I mean, we don't inherently know that 1 is an extremum at all. We saw the x cubed case, the derivative was equal to 0, um, but the critical value was not an extremum. We're kind of, kind of bringing in some knowledge here, or we could, from college algebra. I mean, we know the vertex exists. We know the vertex is a local extremum. We know local extremums can only occur at critical values. So this critical value has to represent the vertex because the vertex is a critical value, and this is the only critical value. Does that argument make sense to everybody? It's, I mean, the formal sort of fancy way of saying that would be the pigeonhole principle. If we have one vertex and we have one critical value, and we know that a vertex has to be a critical value, they have to be the same. Let's, um, so we think this one must be some kind of extremum. Let's classify this. And we'll try to forget our college algebra here if they're thinking, oh, this is a minimum because because the number in front of x squared is positive. Well, you're right, but that's not really what we're doing in this class. We're trying to introduce the first derivative test. So we have the derivative. I'm going to draw a number line. I'm going to draw in our critical value. If we had more than one, I'd put in all of the critical values, but we just have this one. And now, 
I made this observation that the critical values are the only values where the derivative can change sign. So, over to the right of that one, f prime is always positive or it's always negative because it can't change sign in that interval. It can only change sign at the critical values and there aren't any critical values in this interval. There's just this one critical value here. So what this tells us is that we can pick any number in this interval, pick a number greater than one. Um, two. No need to think too long and hard about this. P prime of 2 is 2. 2 times 2 is 4, minus 2 is 2. And 2 is greater than 0. It's positive. So we know that the derivative is always positive or always negative in this region. We know that at 2, it's positive. So if our options are always positive and always negative, and it's sometimes positive, then it must be always positive. Is that an argument that everybody buys? If so, we can repeat that argument to the left of the critical value, the derivative is either always positive or always negative. Again, because the derivative can only change sign at the critical value, and the only critical value we have got is here. There are no critical values over here in the left region. So pick a number, any number, to the left of one. Zero. Zero. Thank you. X equals zero. P prime of zero. Well, 2 times 0 is 0, minus 2 is 2, and negative 2 is negative. So because it's always positive or always negative, and it's sometimes negative, it's always negative. And what do we see then at 1? We see the derivative going from being negative to being positive. And we find our first derivative test. If the derivative is going from 
negative to positive, then the derivative represents, or rather the critical value represents, a minimum. So going back here and finishing this out, We were asked to find and classify the vertex. I suppose um, in a sort of technical sense, we haven't found the vertex because the vertex is a point. We've, um, we found the x coordinate of the vertex. Now we just plug x equals one in here. 1 plus 1 is 2, minus 2 is 0. So there is the vertex. Every vertex is a minimum or a maximum. This vertex is a minimum per the first derivative test. And that's all the first derivative test is. I mean, you could give more <laughs> complicated questions. Um, that complication is just going to come from there being more than one critical value or there being um, difficult to work with derivatives. Maybe setting the derivative equal to zero gives you some kind of ugly number or ugly algebraic process. But fundamentally, to do the first derivative test, we draw the number lines, we mark down any critical values on the number lines. Selecting points between the critical values, like we did here, we decide whether the derivative is positive or negative in these regions. And then we use the first derivative test for classification. Positive to negative is a max. Negative to negative is neither max nor min. Negative to positive is a min. Why don't we pause class and have you repeat this process? We'll keep keep the um, algebra pretty light. So we'll give you a quadratic once again, and we'll just have you find and classify the vertex, and I'm going to specify because this is something I could tell my algebra students to do. We are reviewing or learning calculus here. So create sign charts, use the first derivative test, don't complete the square or do anything like that. I'll be walking around the room if anybody has questions. So, q of x equals negative 2x squared.
squared. Uh, plus x minus 1. So q prime equals negative 4x plus 1. Once again, this, uh, this derivative is always defined. There's no square roots. There's nothing that would give us a division by zero error. There are no logarithms that, uh, that could give us the logarithm of a non-positive number. So we're not going to have any critical values due to the derivative not existing. We can have critical values due to the derivative equaling zero. Subtract one from both sides. Divide both sides by negative four. Our negative signs cancel out, and we get positive one-fourth as our derivative. And now, with that as our only critical value, we can create a sign chart. Remember, sometimes is a source of error. We have all of these sort of equations doodled on the board where looking at the derivative here, not the original function. That's especially an easy mistake to make because it's different from the technique we use to find absolute extrema on closed intervals. When we were looking at absolute <coughs> extrema on closed intervals, we were sticking stuff into the original function. For these relative extrema, also called local extrema, it's the derivative. So a number greater than one fourth, pick anything really. I mean, probably don't want to pick 1.17 or something that will be a pain to stick into the derivative. If we let x be 1, that's negative 4 plus 1. That's negative 3. The derivative is negative. Similarly, picking something to the left of 1 fourth, I Usually pick zero if the opportunity arises. Zero is in this interval. Sticking zero into the derivative gives us one. It's positive. Going from positive to negative is a max. So it's a maximum as for, as for the vertex itself. Somebody already stick one fourth in there? What's uh, the one? Negative 0.875. Okay, if we're going to use decimals, we should probably use decimals. in both the x and the y coordinate. So let's write that as 0.25 comma negative 0.875. We could look at a more complicated example. Um, let's look at
I'm going to come up with this example off the top of my head, so hopefully I don't end up with something so complicated we can't actually do it. But it's been a while since we've done anything with the logarithm, so at the very least, let's remind ourselves of this derivative. Let's look for any local x dreamer as part of that we'll classify any local x dreamer um note that we're on an interval here but we're not on a closed interval, and we're looking for local extrema, not absolute extrema. So this isn't really going to change anything. Um, the reason we're on an interval is that we can only take the natural log of a positive number. So, I mean, x plus ln x, if I, if I pull the graph up, will kind of give away the answer, but oh well. Let's see, Firefox, share it, that's most up. Um, x plus ln x, and we see that it's strictly positive. It also looks like it might not have any absolute or local <clears throat> extrema, but we can investigate that using the tools of calculus. So, let's sort of word in that off. F prime equals one plus one divided by x. So I don't know if I've said this explicitly. Critical values can only occur where the original function was defined. So zero is not a critical value here. Zero does make the derivative undefined, but it also makes the original function undefined. So we don't need to mess around with that. We set this equal to zero. And if we multiply both sides by x, okay, our critical value is at negative 1, but once again, um, negative 1 just makes the function undefined. This is why this is why I took the opportunity to explicitly mention that we are working with the positive numbers here. So there are no critical values. Hence, there are no local 
Exedrema. Um, another kind of thing we could look at, the only examples we've done have had just one critical value. Now we've done an example with no critical values. We should probably do an example with multiple critical values. Uh, good old cubic polynomial might give us what we're looking for. f of x equals x cubed minus 3x squared. Let's find and classify Local Xdrema, or plural Local Xdrema, uh, because I think there's going to be more than one of them. <coughs> Let's do, Let's coordinate that off and work below. F prime equals 3x squared minus 6x. And we're interested in values where this isn't defined or where it's equal to zero. And this is defined everywhere. There's no division that could give us division by zero errors. There are no logarithms like there were here. There are no square roots. This is defined for every value of x. So to find the critical values, we just set this equal to zero. And now we, we could use the quadratic formula. That's not really necessary. We have an x squared and an x. So we can factor this quadratic. No fuss, no muss. Pull a 3 out, in fact. And we get 2 solutions. We are, I mean, I'm hoping that your COVID or algebra prerequisites cover this, but we're using the zero product property here. If we're multiplying things together and getting zero, then one of the things we're multiplying is zero. So either three equals zero, but that can never happen, or x equals zero, or x minus two equals zero, which gives us two as a solution. So zero and two, we have two critical values now. <clears throat> but we're still just going to proceed as normal. We're going to take the derivative, 3x squared minus 6x,
And we're going to fill in where this sign chart is positive and where it's negative. So, I mean, assuming that the derivative isn't too ugly, this is something that maybe you'll end up doing in your head. But for now, that's, that's explicitly jot down what values we're using. So something between 0 and 2. 1 is between 0 and 2. And 3 minus 6, if we plug 1 into the derivative, gives us a negative number. Something to the left of 0. Um, x equals negative 1. Be a little careful with this one. Just this is a place where algebraic or arithmetic errors can creep in. Negative 1 squared is positive 1. So this is a positive 3, and then negative, negative 6 is positive 6. So this is 9, although the actual value, 9, doesn't really matter. What matters is that it's positive. Uh, pick something <coughs> to the right of 2. It, it doesn't matter what specifically. 10. I'm just picking 10 because it's easy for me to do in my head. 300 minus 60 is 240. That's positive, but any number greater than 2 would have done. So x equals 0 represents a local max all the way back to here. If we're going from positive to negative, that's a local max according to the first derivative test. And the first derivative test says that negative to positive is a local min. So we go from negative to positive at 2, and 2 is therefore a local minimum. And if we went ahead and took a look at the graph, x cubed minus 3x squared, that is exactly what we see. A local maximum at zero, a local minimum at two. So that's the idea behind the first derivative test, along with several examples. I might or might not do a few more examples tomorrow. I have to remind myself what sections I've opened and what I'm planning to cover this week. We could do a few more complicated examples, or we could uh, move on to the next section. I will know by tomorrow. Thank you for braving the cold to be here. I'll have to post an announcement reminding your classmates that they are supposed to show up. 
and I will see you tomorrow as well.